What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 13 of Preloaded, the podcast dedicated to previewing and talking about all of the biggest and most exciting upcoming video games. My name is Josh Finderup, and I am joined, as always, by the other half of Preloaded, Jackson Van Over. How are you doing, Jackson? I'm doing great, Josh. We're at the very end of a generation, and yeah, things are about to get crazy. Yeah, I think coming up next week, the time that our next podcast posts, the next generation will have begun. But before that, we do have some interesting stories to talk about this week. We're going to talk about some big delays coming out of Ubisoft. We have some fallout from the big cyberpunk delay. Uh, We got some new Starfield info out of Bethesda, so that's exciting. And at the end of the show, we're going to have a discussion, a retrospective discussion about our thoughts and our experiences with the pre the previous generation of consoles, so the PS4, the Xbox One, and I think I think we're going to limit it to that. I don't think we're going to get into the Switch on this one. But anyways, you want to stay tuned for all of that. But first, you can catch Preloaded, the podcast posts on our YouTube channels on Friday. It posts on Jackson's YouTube channel, he's JV on YouTube, and it posts on mine, I'm Quest Mode. But if you prefer to listen, you can catch the audio versions over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And if you are listening on any of those platforms, we'd love for you to post a review, post a five-star review, of course, if you're enjoying the podcast, that is, or leave a written review. And speaking of, we're actually going to read a written review that someone left us this week. We really appreciate it when we see these come in because it really helps us uh, in the, the algorithm on the podcast platforms, helps people find the podcast. So thank you so much. This one comes to us from Nick, who wrote in on Apple Podcasts and says, quote, these guys are great. They are critical, but not negative. Not only is the podcast great for both of these guys, or not only is the podcast great, but both of these guys have great YouTube channels as well. So again, a huge thank you from both Jackson and I for posting that. We've got, I think, like six reviews, uh, written reviews right now, which is actually amazing that you guys are listening and enjoying. So thank you very much. You can also write into Preloaded if you want to interact with us on the show write into preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. That's preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And you can ask it. You can actually give us any feedback you like, but we'd love to get your questions because at the end of the show, we dig into our mailbag and we discuss one of the questions that uh, you all have written into us. So we look forward to hearing from you and going over your questions right here at the end of the show. And speaking of questions, we are going to kick things off as we always do with the sec- the segment who the hell are these guys? And this is where Jackson and I answer a question about our gaming preferences, our gaming history, to help you, the audience, get to know us better as gamers. And since we are coming up on a console launch, the start of a brand new generation, Jackson, I wanted to kick this question over to you. What is your favorite console launch game of all time? Wow. Okay. Um, thank you, Josh. Or sorry, thank you, Nick. Not Josh. (laughs) Thank you, Nick, for writing in that review. Um, But thank you, Josh, for getting through all of that. That was a lot. Um, (laughs) So my favorite console launch game of all time. You know, I actually misread this question, Josh. I thought it was my favorite console launch. So now I feel... Yeah. (laughs) I feel like I'm on the spot. But I'll answer both. Well, you can answer... Yeah, answer both. Answer either one or both. Okay, here we go. Favorite console launch... Um, For me, this might be a curveball for you guys because I don't talk about Nintendo, but the Wii. The Wii was so special, and I got one of a very limited few for my GameStop. I showed up really early in the morning to wait in line, and it was just a really special experience. And the motion, you know, aspect of the Wii was new at the time, and so it felt unique. And so that's my favorite uh, console launch. But yeah, I'm trying to think of my favorite console launch game, and I think I'm going to go with... Uh, I think it was, I want to say it's a Halo, um, probably the first Halo, Halo Combat Evolved for the original Xbox. That's going back a while, but it was such a revolutionary kind of experience and game, first person shooter. Uh, at the time, everyone was 
very into it, um, I feel like, around the gaming community, and I was just sucked right into it. So that would be my answer. That's awesome. Yeah, those are actually two launch experiences I missed out on. I I didn't get a Wii at launch, and I did not. I was kind of in my period of not gaming when Halo came out for the original Xbox. But uh, those are awesome, uh, awesome stories. Mine is uh, my my. I'll do both as well. My favorite console launch is the Dreamcast because that's the first console that I saved up my own money for, and I stood out in line and uh, picked it up, took it home late that night, and played. Uh, uh, Soul Calibur, which is one of my favorite launch games of all time, but it's not my favorite. My favorite launch game of all time is uh, Super Mario 64. So when that came out, I remember seeing it for the first time in a Target. They had a Nintendo 64 demo, and I was just like, what is this video game where you can wander <laughs> around in 3D as Mario? And um, then I asked for it for Christmas and was lucky enough to get it on Christmas that year. I think that was like 1996. So yeah, we're going way back. Uh, <laughs> but that game is uh, still to this day, as I've mentioned on this show a number of times, it still is one of my, if not my favorite game of all time. So those are my favorite launch games or my favorite launch game and my favorite console launch. So uh, we'd love to hear if uh, you have any favorite console launch experiences or favorite console launch games. Let us know in the comments if you are uh, watching this on YouTube. And with that, we are going to move on to the Out This Week section, and this is a big one. We have two consoles coming out this week. Uh, just to fill you in, this is the segment where we normally go through the games that are coming out the week that we post the podcast, or I guess the week following, so the following Monday through Friday. And normally, we just have a few games, but since we have two consoles, the Xbox Series X and the PS5 coming out, we're going to do things a bit differently. We're going to list out every game that's coming out for the current gen just to get that out of the way. So if you have a PS4 or an Xbox One or a Switch, you'll know what games are coming out. And we're actually going to list m most of, if not all of the games that are on the slate. There are five of them. And then we're going to get into next gen. So let me get this out of the way. So for current gen and PC, we've got Assassin's Creed Valhalla on November 10th. That comes out for, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the consoles and PC. We've then got Destiny 2 Beyond Light, that comes out on November 10th as well, uh, and that comes out on uh, all the consoles and PC, except Switch, of course. Uh, Gears Tactics comes out on the Xbox One, that's Tuesday, November 10th, again. Uh, Planet Coaster, that comes out on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and then The Falconeer comes out on the Xbox One and PC, also on November 10th. So November 10th is a big day. November 12th, we've got Bug Snacks for the PlayStation 4. And again, there's some overlap with next gen. I'm just not getting into the next gen yet because we're going to get into that in a minute. Then we have Just Dance 2021 on November 12th as well. This is all November 12th. Marvel's Spider-Man, Miles Morales, that's a big one, comes out on the PlayStation 4. Sackboy comes out on PlayStation 4. The Pathless also comes out on PlayStation 4. And then on November 13th, we have Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, which comes out on everything except Switch. And then Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory, if you're a Kingdom Hearts fan, comes out on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Switch on, again, November 13th. Okay, so if you're following me, that's all the current gen stuff. Now let's get into next gen. The way we're going to do this is it's just two dates. Well, Mostly just two dates, November 10th and November 12th. We're going to do November 10th for the Xbox Series X first, Series X and S. These all come out for both consoles, and this is the entire launch lineup. And the reason we're doing this is just so if you're getting one of these consoles, you'll know all the games that you'll have available to you. So I'm going to just rattle these off real quick. These all come out on November 12th. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Borderlands 3, Bright Memory, Dead by Daylight, Destiny 2, the full game, Destiny 2 Beyond Light, Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition, Dirt 5, Enlisted, Evergate, Fortnite, Forza Horizon 4, Fuser, Gears 5, Gears Tactics, Grounded, King Oddball, Liftoff, Drone Racing, Maneater, Manifold Garden, NBA 2K21, Observer, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Planet Coaster, Sea of Thieves, Tetris Effect Connected, The Falconeer, Warhammer Chaos Bane, Watch Dogs Legion, WRC9, Yakuza Like a Dragon, and Yes, Your Grace. So those are all the games that are going to be available on your Xbox Series X that you can play without any backwards compatibility. Those are all designed for the Xbox Series X and S. 
So there you go. Moving on to Thursday, November 12th. This is the PlayStation 5 launch, and here are all the games that are going to be available for the PlayStation 5. Again, not with any backwards compatibility or anything. These are like full-on PS5 versions of the game. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Astro's Playroom, Borderlands 3, Bug Snacks, Demon Souls, Destiny 2, the full game, Destiny 2 Beyond Light, Devil May Cry 5, Dirt 5, Fortnite, Godfall, Just Dance 2021, Maneater, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, NBA 2K21, Observer, Planet Coaster, Sackboy, A Big Adventure, The Pathless, and Watch Dogs Legion. All of that is for the PlayStation 5 on launch day. And then finally, we have one outlier on Friday, November 13th, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War comes out for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S, as well as uh, the old generation consoles and PC. Okay. <laughs> we did it. I'm surprised I didn't run out of uh, breath on that. And uh, yeah, I, I've been I've been talking for way too long. So Jackson, I'm just going to see if you have any initial reaction to this like onslaught of games. So yes, uh, a lot of games. And I'm glad the way we kind of wanted to present this to you guys was, like Josh said, there's going to be a lot of... Um, you know, next gen, like this is made for the next gen titles. This is what these are um, in, in the latter section of out this week. So it's important to note that this stuff is made for next gen. However, you're still going to have that huge backlog of backwards compatibility games. Pretty much every single, actually every single game for for the Xbox and like 99% of games for PS4. Of course, we, we listed out the very few that you couldn't play, but Bottom line, you're going to have so much to play on launch. It's a very healthy launch ecosystem. I actually think for for both consoles this time around, maybe a little less in terms of exclusives for Xbox. Those will come later. Uh, You got more of that going on in the PlayStation side of things. But I'm really excited to be able to play all of this on next gen. It's never been like this before. Yeah, it really feels kind of like a buffet of games that you have to choose from. And you're right, it has never been like this. Every time before, it's, you know, we've had maybe a handful on PS4 and Xbox One where I remember like Assassin's Creed Black Flag came out uh, across generations. There were two versions of that game. But for the most part, if you wanted to play something on either your Xbox One or your PS4, it had to be a game specifically made for that console and not prior gens. This is just tons of games that have a lot of overlap with last gen and this gen. Of course, again, these are versions that are made for the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. But for that reason, it's a very different console launch lineup than we've ever seen before and a much more packed launch lineup. Um, But maybe not as exciting because, you know, you have to kind of dig, especially on Xbox, to find anything that was made specifically for these consoles. I totally get that. And I think in terms of an exclusive perspective, if that's the big thing, if you're looking for that one game that's going to get you to make the leap, you're right. It's I don't think it's on Xbox. It's more likely on PlayStation. But hopefully that changes in the future and we have some more exciting titles on Xbox as well. And that's coming from someone who's also getting an Xbox Series X. Yeah, yeah. And we're both getting uh, both consoles. So we'll be yeah. able to report back on whatever we end up playing and just kind of how they perform. But uh, yeah, lots to look forward to in the coming week. It's a big week in gaming. Great time to be a gamer. Uh, we'll look forward to reporting back. And uh, if you guys, again, if, if anyone listening or, or watching is uh, going to be getting these consoles, uh, we'd love to hear your experiences in the comments. Um, moving on, though, we are now going to look back at the, the week that just finished up and we have our review roundup. Every week, we just look at the games that came out and see how uh, Open Critic is scoring those games. Not quite as many games to cover here. We have three on the list. Dirt 5 reviews uh, came in, and that's getting an 80 80- critic average, and 90% of uh, critics are recommending it. So great reviews for Dirt 5. This is one that looks gorgeous. uh, I'll I'll, I'll check it out a little bit. I think I might as well. Yeah, I I think it's on Game Pass, and I mentioned this. If it is, no doubt I'm going to at least download it and play it. The Dark Pictures Anthology came out to uh, kind of mixed reviews, well, very mixed reviews, rather. Critic, the critic average is 72%, and it is a getting a 49% recommended rating. So not the best there. And then finally, Yakuza, Dra- Yakuza Like a Dragon. This might be the first like next-gen game that we're getting reviews for. I'm not sure if these are on next-gen consoles. Nonetheless, a critic average rating of 87% and a recommended score of 94%. Yeah, these just came in this morning and... 
Um, we've talked about Yakuza a couple times here on the show, but uh, it's not something I immediately wanted to pick up, but now I do because of these. It, this is just another reason. Like hilarious trailers, that that was one reason. <laughs> this is another. When a game gets reviewed this highly and it's a next gen, you know, on the cusp launch title, or oh, it is a launch title, then yeah, it gets me interested. Yeah, me too. I'm very interested in Yakuza Like a Dragon, but same same old story as we've said uh, many times. If there's time, I'll check it out. Uh, but uh, that is our review roundup. We are now going to take our first break, and when we get back, we're going to dig into the weekend previews and talk a bunch more next-gen news. We'll be right back. And we're back. We are now going to dig into the week in previews. This is where Jackson and I look at all of the news about all of the upcoming games that came out the week prior and we have uh, something really spectacular to kick things off. Demon Souls, uh, or rather PlayStation launched a Demon Souls trailer that just looks amazing. This game, every time uh, they release something, it ends up looking better and better, um, and it continues to look great. Uh, Jackson, you actually kicked this over to me. I didn't see this the day that it launched. You, you, well, you, you put it in the dock, and then I looked at it. But did you want to give your initial impressions of this trailer? Sure. And yeah, I do want to note this is probably, I think, a week old by the time you guys are going to hear our impressions, which is fine. We do a weekly show. But uh, this came out on a Friday, I believe. And it just blew my mind, um, just like Josh said, in terms of, of visuals. Blue Point Games, they they remade Shadow of the Colossus, and that was fantastic. But this is a full-on remake, not just a remaster, as you guys know. And it, yeah, continues to look really impressive. I was blown away by how smooth this game is. I think it's one of the most next gen feeling games that we've seen so far. I don't mm-hmm. know if yeah, if you would agree with me there, Josh, but it just feels next gen. Yeah, the details in just the like the the spider that is in this when he uh, kind of rears up on his hind legs and you can see all the, the creepy crawly stuff underneath him just looks so detailed and gorgeous. And uh, yeah, I don't know really what else to say. I was a little bummed out, not really disappointed, but I was bummed out that they didn't, they still haven't shown the UI to this game. So I don't know how the, like the health bars and all that and the stamina is going to work. I'm sure if you've, Go yeah, ahead. I, I wonder why they're doing that. Is it a marketing thing or they just want to put like how high fidelity the game performs as like, you know, front and focused? They don't want to have anything else kind of busy on the screen. I kind of get that, but I, I'm with you. I'd like to see the UI. Yeah, and it's that's probably why they probably know that they've got a real stunner on their hands and they just want people to look at the pretty graphics, which uh, mission accomplished. Um <laughs> Yeah, they, they also uh, revealed one interesting detail, and that is that the game will have 180 of those little game guide videos that you can pop up in the UI if you end up needing help, which is uh, interesting on a Souls game. Obviously, these are incredibly challenging games, and I know I, I think I mentioned it on the last week's show when I played like Sekiro and Bloodborne. I don't normally use guides, but I wouldn't have gotten through either of those games without a guide. Yes, I wouldn't have either. I had to look stuff up. Um, Some of you guys like to do that like we do and kind of make sure you do it on your own and unless you have to or some of you like to have help immediately. In any case, I think this is a win to have game guides within the game because if you need that help, it's just right there. You don't have to leave your screen. Yeah, yep. So Demon Souls continues to look excellent. It is one of the, I, I believe, truly next-gen games uh, on the slate of games that we just went over in the previous segment. So uh, if you are getting a PS5 and you like to beat your head against a wall, this <laughs> is definitely a must-play. At least that's the way I look at it. Yes, me too. So speaking of the PlayStation 5, uh, I ordered a, um, a, a DualSense controller an extra one because I had some issues with my dual shock when I first got my PlayStation 4 and I needed an extra controller and I didn't want to find myself in the same boat and that controller showed up in the mail so we wanted to do a little just hands-on impression of the dual sense and and here it is I haven't actually been able to use it apparently this is you can use it on a PlayStation 3 but not a PlayStation 4 I have not experimented with that what? but um that's so yeah. weird yeah, so a story came out that people were trying to use it on their old consoles, and it wouldn't, it won't work apparently on a PlayStation Four, but it will. I'm just going to kind of hold it up here as I talk. It won't work on a PlayStation Four, but it will work on a PlayStation Three. And and uh, I've just had a busy week. I haven't had time to give it a shot and dig out my PS3, but uh, nonetheless, I did get a chance, obviously, to hold it in my hands and and you know feel what it feels like, and um, you know 
first off, Jackson, did you just have any questions about it or anything like that? Yes. Yeah, so I've I've heard generally speaking that it feels more uh, sturdy is the wrong word. I would say, does it feel more like weighty? Like it, it fills out your hands. That's kind of a funny way of describing it. But do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it is weighty and it, it okay. is it does feel sturdy. So I have right here uh, my dual. Should I need to turn these around. This is really awkward to like show these <laughs> off on camera. But yeah, so here's my dual shock uh, and my dual sen- sense. And the dual sense does feel to me more hefty. Okay. I, actually, hefty is the wrong word. There is more weight to it, but okay. it feels more narrow when you hold the um, the actual uh, sides of the controller. It's shaped to me. It feels much more shaped like an Xbox One controller, which I have that here as well. Okay, um, that's a good so, thing in my book. Yeah, because the sides of the Dual Shock are kind of round and wide at the bottom, and I don't like that as much. But this, they t- it tapers off much more at the bottom, so. That makes it feel much more like an Xbox One controller. Like if you look at the back of the Xbox and the Dual Sense, they're kind of if you take away the triggers on the Dual Sense, they're almost indistinguishable um, in terms of the shape. So that's a that was a plus for me too because my Xbox One controller I don't use it as much, but it's my favorite controller. Yeah, it feels more. Uh, the word I'm going to use is organic, uh, whereas the Dual Shock to me felt more like you were holding kind of an object you know what I mean like you're holding something that was designed to be like a product whereas like the X I don't know I just really like the way the Xbox controllers feel yeah I think you'll be happy when you first put your hands around a dual sense it does feel more like an Xbox controller um, some other things I noticed is uh, I was expecting it to be just stark white and this is not, not really an issue it's more just a matter of preference but I was a little disappointed. It's actually kind of like an off white and an off gray. Like it's a really light gray. Yeah. So again, I don't know if this will come across on the camera, but I have my Xbox one controller and I'm holding it next to my Xbox. And uh, for the audio viewers, I I apologize (laughs) for this being such a visual segment, but um, the Xbox one controller is like stark bone white. The um, not so much for the, uh, the dual sense. So my initial impression was I didn't, I just didn't like the way it looked as much as I'd hoped, but I'll get over it. Um, and then uh, other than that, you know, the triggers feel just like the Dual Shock. The bumpers are a little bigger than the Dual Shock, so the L1 and the L2. And the buttons and the D-pad have a more glossy finish, so they don't they're, they, they just feel more uh, smooth. And other than that, the the, the um, analog sticks feel very solid. Overall, I'm I'm very happy with it. I'll be really excited to try it out and see what the uh, the actual the the feedback from the controller the the features feel like, but yes, I, I am too. I think that's really where the magic is going to come from with that controller. Yep. Yeah, me too. So I don't want to spend too much time on that if we haven't already, since we didn't, I didn't get a chance to actually use it, but we have some, uh, some more news to get into. This is more around, uh, games, uh, current gen and next gen from Ubisoft far cry six and rainbow six quarantine have been delayed. This comes to us via GameSpot, who wrote quote, Ubisoft has pushed two of its biggest games, Far Cry 6 and Rainbow Six Quarantine, out of the current fiscal year and into fiscal year 2021 to 2022. That means we'll see them coming sometime between April 2021 and March 2022. During an earnings call, CFO Frederick Duguay, Duguay, I'm just going to go with that, uh, narrowed that timeline slightly, saying the company expects both to hit in the first half of the fiscal year. And the article went on to say, Uh, that the company announced the delays as part of its recent uh, financial earnings statement. It also updated its expectations to reflect the delays of these two, quote, high contribution titles, which it says were delayed due to production challenges related to work from home. Uh, Far Cry 6 was initially set for a February 2021 release, and Rainbow Six Quarantine was targeting early 2021. So any reaction to this, Jackson? Yes. um, Disappointing, obviously, um, but... Personally, it, I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me big time. I mean, these are two titles that I do want to play. Uh, the little that we've seen from Far Cry 6 looked compelling to me. Uh, yeah. And Rainbow Six Quarantine, not as much, uh, but but still. Uh, I just want to play games when they're ready, and I have a feeling that we're going to be playing these launch titles and like Cyberpunk in December. We're going to be playing those games for a while. So I'm okay to wait longer. Yeah, me too. And and especially for Ubisoft games. I mean, I probably wasn't going to get into uh, 
quarantine, I, I can't imagine I would have. But with Far Cry, it's like even Ubisoft is kind of cannibalizing their own release calendar. I, am I going to be ready for another Ubisoft <laughs> open world after Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed Valhalla? So this this actually was kind of good news to me. Yes, and I wanted to give a little shout out to uh, a YouTube creator. I'm sure a lot of you guys know him. Um, Jor Raptor speculates yeah. after this news that he thinks that this means uh, this confirms his earlier prediction that there will be a new Assassin's Creed next year, which he's mm-hmm. a lot more well versed in kind of how Ubisoft works and what kind of you know earnings and stuff they're trying to hit each year. Um, that's crazy to me, though. I would be, uh, I would be personally shocked. I'm, I'm not saying that I know more than Jor. I think he probably knows more than me. But um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see if that actually comes true. That would very much. So he's saying it would come out in 2021. Yeah, he's saying it'll come out holiday 2021. And like we know about Valhalla's post-launch content, they've already got plans for fall 2021. So yeah, I would be surprised as well. But you know, we'll see. Um, that would be very interesting. Moving on, CD Projekt Red came out and maybe said something when they shouldn't have. I don't know. This seems like they've just they should just <laughs> put their you know put their nose to the grindstone and keep working, keep trucking on Cyberpunk. Anyhow, they came out and had a quote that uh, got a little a few people raising their eyebrows about their December tenth release date. This one is from PushSquare.com. And in this article, they say, quote, speaking during CD Projekt Red's latest call with shareholders, Adam Kaczynski said, quote, we feel maybe not comfortable, but not. No, sorry, let me start that over. We feel, yeah, maybe not comfortable, but confident in the new release date. Again, not the kind of comment that you want to hear if you're betting on Cyberpunk hitting its new date. And the article went on to say, quote, even Michael Nowakowski, vice president of business development, doesn't seem totally sold on the idea. When asked if the game would definitely launch on the 10th of December, he replied, quote, that's more or less what I'm saying. I guess. Yes. So, (laughs) man, cyberpunk. Yeah, this is rough. Uh, And I, I think some people pointed this out in the YouTube comments, at least on my video last week for our show and said, guys, if you look closer into this, it's not a guarantee. Obviously, it hasn't been a guarantee for the last several release dates. And things happen. I really do want to sort of sympathize with the huge cyberpunk fans. Like, that, if this is your number one game, hearing something like this is just another gut punch. Like, you're already on the ground and you're just being kicked on the ground. That's a little dramatic, but that's how some people feel. And that really sucks for those people. Yeah, it's just to to me, I agree. And I just don't know why you would announce another release date and then undermine that announcement with a statement like this. Just doesn't make any sense to me. And I think it's a bit uh it's a bit much at this point. And uh, I'm glad we're covering it on this show. I do wanna not that anyone at CD Project Red is listening to this, but just feel like people should be holding them accountable at this point. It's like you know what this reminded me of? It was over the summer when The Last of Us Two got delayed. And they didn't announce a release date. They said it's delayed indefinitely. And of course, that was against the backdrop of COVID. And everybody was really freaking out about that, rightfully so. But I feel like that maybe that's a better strategy for something like this. I agree. And it also makes CD Projekt, uh, again, lots of has gone on COVID, whatnot. Uh, But the when it's ready line that they used however long ago I mean, they just did not stick to that. It's it's kind of funny that they claim to say it'll be ready when it's ready, but they keep, you know, putting release dates out there. So disappointing. Still going to play the heck out of it when it comes out. Yeah, for sure. Yep. It'll be fun to get our hands on it. Hopefully December 10th. So look forward to that. Uh, moving on, we got a big uh, story f- about Starfield from uh, uh, directly from Todd Howard over at Bethesda. Uh, did you want to uh, take this one, Jackson? Sure. Yes. So Todd Howard was a keynote speaker, I believe, at like a a school, like a postgrad game development, something like that. And um, he was part of a QA, and a but we're just taking the part about Starfield because that's obviously the big information. But there's also some stuff about The Elder Scrolls Six in here, too. So Todd Howard went ahead and confirmed that Starfield is a single player game only. No multiplayer aspects, no kind of Yams Viking, you know, online connection, anything like that. That's how I read this quote. Like this is just a single player experience, which is going to make a lot of people happy, I think. 
um, especially after the recent, you know, stuff that's been going on with Bethesda. So that's yep. good to hear. Um, a lot of people will be happy about that. It's not Starfield 76. <laughs> exactly. None of that. No 76. Leave that off the end of the title. Uh, he also talked more about the huge overhaul to the engine, to the creation engine, which we heard about before, but more specifically to the rendering, the animation, the AI and pathing, and the procedural generation that they use to create the worlds. Now, I did want to um, specify on that. They're not just procedurally generating. Uh, it's, it's not like a No Man's Sky situation. They just use that tech in order to build out their world. And they've been doing that for years, but it's just gotten a little bit better, um, of course, which is something you expect. Uh, on yeah. the release date... He said, quote, it's going to be a while until we see Starfield subject. It's also subject to delay like any game. Um, so he's not comfortable talking about dates yet. And he also went on to say that he doesn't want to release a ton of teaser trailers, which I'm actually glad that he said that because Fallout 4 was just still sticks in our mind as one of the best, you know, reveal your game. Then it comes out a couple months later with no hitches like that is yeah. what I want from my game releases. Yeah, per our previous conversation, actually, that's like exactly they seem to be taking a great strategy here. One hundred percent. We've got a few more details here. I'll be quick. NPCs will play a larger role in future Bethesda Game Studios games. So they're focusing more into that side of uh, their games, which is nice. And also the cities will be expansive and large compared to previous games. So if you ever thought cities felt too small those are going to be improved in a next-gen way is the way I would probably describe it. Um, we also got some very exciting news because, as we know, Bethesda was inquire, acquired. ZeniMax was acquired by Microsoft, right? And uh, Todd said that Starfield and The Elder Scrolls VI will be available on Game Pass day one, which I think is huge, right, Josh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's. I mean, those are the years, Whenever whatever years these games come out, those will be either the most anticipated game of the year or right up there in the top one or two. So the fact that they're basically free, I put that in air quotes for people who have uh, game pass is a massive boon for Microsoft. I think so too. And I think this is unrelated to this story, but I think recently we got some kind of news that solidified the fact that it makes no sense for them to make them exclusive. I, I really, I'm, I'm being pushed more towards the idea that these will be available on all consoles. You'll just see the Game Pass day one um, with with uh, with Bethesda games, which is interesting. Big. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of leaning. It's over over the course of the last few weeks, I've kind of leaned in the other direction where I think that these might actually end up being exclusive, but uh, it's still I think too early to tell. But um, yeah, then, yeah, it'll that'll be a big bomb if it drops. It'll be it'll be major news, and uh, we'll have a lot to talk about. But uh, we don't know anything really concrete about that. But this is exciting for me. I I mean I love uh, I'm I play single player games. That's my that's what I do. And so the fact that this is really focusing on that is hugely exciting for me. And uh, yeah, we I think we had heard some stuff about the rumblings about the the uh, the engine getting an upgrade. So, you know, obviously I, I think most people are expecting these games to look spectacular. I'm referring to both Starfield and Elder Scrolls, but um, very cool. The only thing that's, you know, it's not really a bummer, but it's, you know, we're going to have to wait a while to, I think, see this game and then play this game. I think that we should have very conservative expectations on when this thing comes out. A um, couple of years. That's what I would leave it at, at least. Yeah, and uh, they. I see you put one more thing in here that's just interesting to me that at least four or five times the developers are working on this than worked on either Skyrim or Fallout 4. So apparently a massive team is working on this game. Yeah, and I don't know about you, Josh. I get nervous the more people work on a game. Um, and I, I don't know that that's, that's necessarily a logical <laughs> like uh, conclusion when I hear that because like Ubisoft teams are massive. And yep. Ubisoft games generally have been good, um, so especially in the last couple of years. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, we'll uh, keep our uh, keep listening for more news on Starfield. Uh, but uh, exciting stuff there. Uh, another massive game coming out that we got some info on. This one a little bit sh uh, sooner on the horizon. Final Fantasy 16 had a pretty decent sized info drop on their official website, which they updated to reveal some main story details. Uh, if you go to the website, they revealed three bios of main characters, and they also revealed kind of a, a illustrated world map of the game world, which is called Valisthea, and they revealed six uh, descriptions for the six realms 
that make up this world. Now, I'm not a Final Fantasy lore expert, so I'm not going to get into too many details. However, I was able to figure out that it appears the story will revolve around what are called uh, icons or icons. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, spelled E I K O N S. And these are the summons from Final Fantasy. So if you've played like Final Fantasy VII Remake or any of them, really, those big creatures that you can summon in battle, uh, those are steeped in Final Fantasy lore. And this story apparently revolves somewhat around them. And again, the game takes place, if you watch the trailer and the PlayStation 5 event, you know that this is like a high fantasy world. And it has, from my, from what I saw on the new stuff they revealed on the website, a very similar aesthetic to like um, the promotional materials that they might have used for like a Final Fantasy VI, which goes way back. But if you're a Final Fantasy fan, you know that's one of the most popular games in the series. So that's kind of the aesthetic they're going for. Uh, and I'm going to leave it there because, again, I'm not a... Not a Final Fantasy expert, but that's what was revealed uh, last week. And, uh, you know, I think this game is scheduled. I should have looked this up, but I believe it's scheduled to come out in 2021, uh, which would be amazing. A quicker turnaround than t- uh, we typically get from Square Enix. Yeah, I feel like and I am even less of an expert than Josh on Final Fantasy, but I feel like it takes a long time for these games to come out. So um Yeah, hopefully crossing your fingers that this thing comes out sooner rather than later. But it's awesome to see people that are into this uh, get some more information. Yeah, yeah. Um, And uh, just Square Enix is notorious for, uh, you know, we've been kind of focusing on delays this whole episode. But Square Enix is is notorious for extending their development cycle. So we'll see. But very cool if you're a fan of Final Fantasy. Uh, And then another game that got some news this week that uh, is also in the 2021 window, let's hope, is Resident Evil Village. And this was posted directly to uh, the PlayStation uh, site or blog. Jackson, did you pick this up? Yes. So this is like, there's, there's you've got the PlayStation blog, which usually goes into more detail. Then you've got just the regular PlayStation.com with a list of games. And uh, they just updated, Capcom updated just the description, basically, for Resident Evil Village. Village, and this is probably going to be information that's very obvious, so I'm going to rattle through it pretty quickly. Um, The game is first person, like RE7, which I think is was a great kind of shift for the series. Personally, we I know we got RE2 and RE3, and those were third person, and they're their own thing. But I like having both. Um, It's kind of cool. It's Uh, much scarier to me being in first person by by a long shot. Yes, much scarier. RE7, you told us about that on several episodes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, just how scary it is, but. Yes, the story is set years after RE7 with Ethan Winters and Mia living peacefully until another tragedy happens, of course. Obviously, there's got to be tragedy in Resident Evil. Um, But yes, Chris Redfield is returning. We already knew that, but we got a little more information. He has sinister motives, unlike other games. So he's not really the hero this time around, uh, which is interesting. And then enemies within the village will hunt Ethan and hinder his every move, similar like we had to the family in RE7, which... You know, Capcom would be dumb to not implement a similar system because that was one of the, for me personally, creepiest, most haunting parts of that game is being hunted constantly. Yep. So, yeah. 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 Very interesting. It's uh, having played Resident Evil 7 recently. uh, I'm very excited for this. I, I unfortunately I didn't get a chance to finish it because of everything going on, but I just love that it, it was It was so true to the original Resident Evil games, but in a completely different way with the first person perspective and uh, this new setting and these new enemies. And uh, but yeah, being hunted was in that game, man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, stressful. What's his name? Jack, the yeah, the dad, granddad, whatever. Man, he oh, it's terrifying. Yep. Um, And I don't know if you mentioned this. Have they mentioned if this is going to be available in VR like Resident Evil 7 was? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not actually sure about that. That would be that'd be interesting. Um, something for our viewers to to maybe look up if you're curious. But uh, yeah, so this uh, not sure we have a, a release window for this, but I believe they have said it's coming out in 2021, which I guess that's a release window, but a wide one. Yes, I I expect this next year. I really do. Um, and hopefully, yeah, latter half of the year, I would say. Yeah, and speaking of next year, although maybe first half. This is a quick hit for you. Uh, Gran Turismo 7 may launch in the first half of 2021 for the PlayStation 5. Uh, A screenshot was leaked, or I guess it wasn't leaked, it was captured, and it was posted online of an advertisement for Gran Turismo, or for the PlayStation 5, 
that featured Gran Turismo 7 in it. And over the screenshot that they had of Gran Turismo 7, there was some language which I believe was in French, but it it translated to read release schedule for the first half, release scheduled rather, for the first half of 2021. So it, it looks legit. If you if you can dig this up on the internet, it, it looks like a real ad. And if it is saying, if what it's saying is true, then Gran Turismo 7 is at least scheduled for the first half of 2021. So look forward to that if you are a racing simulation fan, which I don't believe either of us are. <laughs> yeah, not personally, but it's always cool to see these games. They're kind of like the tentpole games for PlayStation, at least the new consoles. So I want to see yep. like how amazing this game looks on a PS5. Yeah, I bought Forza 7 when it came. I think it was Forza 7. No, no, no. Forza 5, whichever one came out with the Xbox One. I bought it just to basically see how pretty things could get. And I imagine this game is going to be spectacular. Yes, absolutely. All right, so that is all of the news that we got last week about games and the consoles that are coming out in the coming week, weeks, and months. But we are going to actually look back for our deep dive discussion this week. We're going to have a retrospective discussion about the previous generation, about the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. Uh, I know I've really enjoyed owning both of these consoles, and uh, they've been a big part of my life over the past Gosh, what has it been, Jackson? I think seven or eight years. It's wow. It's it's tough. I think 2013 is when they came out. 2013 or 2014. Um, I'm actually yeah, struggling I, no, to I, remember. I think it was 2013. So that's uh, that's a good at least seven years. And uh, yeah, lots of games, lots of experiences. But uh, one question I just wanted to kind of toss out there is, what do you think these consoles and this generation of consoles will be remembered for, if anything? I think top of mind for me um, is the stumble out of the gate that Microsoft had with the Connects mm. and the All-in-One. Um, I know that that's negative, but that's always going to gonna stick in my mind. I will never forget that. And that kind of allowed Sony, I believe, to, to jump out and take a big lead. And um, that that's a big thing that uh, I think is still affecting Microsoft and kind of their brand. They've obviously made great strides in the last couple of years, ever since, ever since uh, really Phil Spencer uh, got in the helm and started writing that ship in the, in the right direction. Um, so for me, I would say <laughs> that is one thing I will always remember about Xbox One. Yeah, that really did define the... I mean, that's... that's I don't know if you could say that's the the reason, but that is a huge reason PlayStation pulled so far ahead. Is yeah, uh, Microsoft they did not do them any themselves any favors, and Sony really capitalized on it. So that did pretty much define the the competition between the two. And right. um, you know, hopefully, uh, Microsoft it appears as if they have learned <laughs> some lessons and uh, are doing a much better job. But they haven't ha- they haven't been without stumble moving on to next gen either. Yes. Yeah. They, they've still got some some room to go. I do like that their messaging now, though, is focused on the games, which was what PlayStation's been all along. Um, so they definitely took a cue from their competitor there. Uh, I'm glad that the focus is back where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of going over that question in my head a little bit before the show, what what popped up for me is I know we had games as a service. And I almost feel like a broken record using that term on this show, but whatever you want to call them, I I feel like this is the generation that, uh, or this generation will be remembered for some of these games. And uh, I don't know how they're going to look moving forward, but wherever they go, I feel like that is going to be uh, a result of what everybody, what developers learned in this generation. And maybe I'm being hopeful about that, but I feel like, you know, with, with Anthem, with um, I'm just trying to think of some of the big ones that came out this generation. Fallout 76 is another huge one um, that just didn't pan out. Yes, Battleborn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take any opportunity I can to plug Battleborn. Um, yes, definitely a lot of models that came out. Uh, what was that big Lawbreakers? Lawbreakers was a huge flop. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and then the other one, the, the one that came out right after it. Well, I, the one I was thinking of was uh, that was a total flop. Was Radical Heights that was That's kind of it. trying to trying to latch onto the battle uh, battle royale genre. Yeah, so lots of um, attempts, lots of failures. I think it's also wrapped into the looter shooter genre as well. I think looter yeah. shooters really blew up 
And you kind of see that as a result, I feel like, of Borderlands, who's kind of always been doing that. But then yep. you take it and kind of mix it with live service, and that's what you got a lot of. Uh, you already kind of mentioned it with Anthem. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, like, genre-defining games, I feel like, uh, filled out this generation. Yeah, uh, one other thing that I think was, like, a big, at least for me, uh the question at the beginning of the generation, I remember some people were genuinely asking, do exclusives matter? And I think we got the overwhelming answer this generation that, yes, they do matter. And I think that that if you if you're asking the question, like, how did this gen affect next gen? I think that might be one of the biggest stories that played out and that we're going to see continue to play out now that Microsoft is obviously just uh, pouring dump trucks of money on these developers that they're buying like Bethesda. Yes, they are answering the call, um, I think is probably the best way to put it, because the the gauntlet has been thrown for the last seven years by PlayStation. Like, it just doesn't even match up. You can try and compare, but you can't, I, I, in my opinion. It's obviously a subjective thing, but um, you can't just in sheer volume and quality of exclusives. So I'm really hoping that, like you said, Microsoft and all of their acquisitions, they've really gone big or go home. They've gone big on um, on this next gen. So hopefully we see kind of both console ecosystems leveling out. I think that's best. Uh, I mean, obviously you want competition and competition breeds better and better products. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see from Xbox. Yeah. Yeah. So how about just like any favorites? I mean, whether they're favorite memories or favorite games or favorite developers from the the previous generation i mean what is the what where does your brain go when you think of your fondest parts or memories from this generation man it's tough um i want to say still what sticks in my mind is all of these sony exclusives these playstation exclusives um so god of war i again i have major recency bias but man god of war was such an excellent game a lot of my oh my gosh, mind blown experiences were, yeah, they were on PlayStation, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, obviously, Bloodborne, huge, you know, Th- those are the kind of games that I'm going to remember. And probably because I dusted off my PlayStation 4 and played them just for that. I played most of my games actually on my Xbox or my PC, but I came for the exclusives. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I, uh, I have, I have played most of the games I've played on, on this gen on my PlayStation 4, and that is due in large part to the fact that, yeah, these exclusives, they draw me in. They really a- attract me. They're they're my type of game, particularly from Sony, and so I'm just playing on my PlayStation 4. So when a third-party game comes around, I'm like, well, I might as well, you know, rack up my trophy score and just not hook up another not, – not necessarily even hook up, but even switch over the input on my TV from HDMI 2 to HDMI 3 – it's like that simple. That's why I play on my PlayStation. Um, but uh, it's interesting because I started out the generation thinking, all right, I'm going to give each of these consoles a fair shake. I got a PlayStation 4 and an Xbox One. And I hooked up the PlayStation 4. Everything worked great. Then I hooked up my Xbox One and the controller wouldn't work. That was what I was talking about earlier. And it was this huge fiasco. I had to get a new controller and it was like, It just frustrated me, and I feel like that set me off on the wrong foot with Microsoft this generation. And I never, I never latched on to the Xbox after that um, for many reasons beyond that, obviously. But I'm really excited about where Microsoft is going, and I'm doing the same thing this gen, getting both consoles. I'm actually all the games I'm playing right now for my channel. I've been playing on my Xbox One, and I it's a great experience. So I'm hoping that for the next gen, I can have a bit more even. I don't know how you would describe it, but I hope I can split my time more evenly between the, these two consoles. Right. It's like you said, I agree with you. It's We're starting off on much better feet um, just from at, right out of the gate. I think it's much more even. And um, like you said, the Xbox playing experience is so much better. It's funny that you mentioned the controller not connecting. I had that issue too <laughs> on <laughs> launch. It was the most frustrating thing. And the fact that you have to look this stuff up and do all these dumb, like unplug the you know, console five times. It just, it was a frustrating experience and I don't think we're going to run into that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't either. So, you know, 
any anything else you want to you know discuss about the previous gen i mean like favorite developers or um just anything at all I don't know why my brain is scattered. It could be what's happening in the world right now, but it's I'm, <laughs> I'm having a hard time coming up with favorite devs for some reason. I, I do actually, though, I do want to mention um, how this generation, I don't want to be negative, but I don't think we saw as big a leap as we expected going in. Um, I, I think we just got better looking games, but it didn't blow me away like I thought it would. It took until I would say the last two or three years to really blow me away. Like the God of Wars, the Red Dead 2s, the and and we typically see that like towards the end of the generation, we get really incredible, incredible games because it takes years for devs to to learn the tech. And uh, once they've got that down, then they're able to produce some of the best stuff. But um, I would say that last gen didn't feel as next gen as I wanted it to, but I think this upcoming next gen is going to feel next gen. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting discussion. I mean, I remember, and I'm sure you do too, with some of the older generations where the leap forward in graphics, like from obviously the PS1 to PS2, but then even the PS2 to the PS3 or Xbox to Xbox 360 was a massive leap. And you're absolutely it right. It wasn't it wasn't as mind blowing, but I, I do remember firing up of all games. It was Resogun on my PlayStation Four when I first got it, and uh, I remember thinking, I was like, "Yep, this game could not run on a PlayStation Three, no way." Um, but it still wasn't that uh, that generational leap that we had become accustomed to. But I recently went back and played Arkham Origins. Uh, okay. I think that was around like June of this year. I played it on my PS Three, and man, if you want to know how good games have really do look compared to last gen go back and play a last gen game even if it's i mean arkham origins i'm sure when it came out was uh, you know at kind of the cutting edge of graphics at the time and right. now it's it's very obvious that it is, it is an old game and so yeah when you compare it to things like um even arkham knight but all but even more stark of a contrast god of war um gears of gears 5 is one of the prettiest games i played this generation um yeah, it's 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 definitely there's definitely been an advancement. Now for next gen, I I kind of think that we, a lot of people are going to be playing games, and if you don't have a trained eye, you're going to be like, I I don't know what the difference is. I think it's going to be more uh, quality these quality of life things, and then the the things in like Ratchet and Clank where you can go from world to world without any loading. I think that's what's going to be really noticeable. Yes, I, I think the loading will be huge. Um, but I actually am banking on frame rate. I think that frame rate mm. is going to be a huge, um, and I know we're not getting confirmed 60 FPS, but I, I legitimately do feel that playing 30 versus 60 on a TV is all the world's difference. And so I think for a lot of gamers that aren't, you know, playing on PC, uh, you know, experiencing those higher frame rates, they're going to have their minds blown. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we all get our minds blown when we get these consoles. That would be a, a perfect world right there. And uh, it very well may happen. I mean, I know some of these games look look spectacular. Um, I was I don't know if that's a pun because I was thinking Spider-Man at the time. Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to look great. And uh, when we get God of War and then anything Xbox releases Halo, I guess when that comes out, it's going to be really interesting to see what they reveal when that finally comes out. So, um, yeah, it's a. It's kind of a, it's 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 going to be interesting. I will say I was playing a game recently. It was Watch Dogs, and it which has a lot of loading if you want to like switch characters. Mm -hmm. And I there's just going to be no going back when we get these new consoles to the old. I think that is going to be we're going to sit there and think how did we deal with load times? Yes, we're going to sit there and be like, how did we wait for three minutes for to, to get into a house in Skyrim back in 2011? <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's yeah. what the experience was. And then it got better this last gen. And then SSD is just going to blow it out of the water completely. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I think I've said it twice this time, this podcast already. We have a lot to look forward to with these next gen consoles coming up just really this week. If you're listening to this, uh, you know, when it posts or shortly after. So very, very exciting time. Uh, but with that, we are going to move on to uh, the what we're playing section of our podcast. But first, we are going to take a, another quick break. We'll be right back. And we're back. We are now going to talk about what we've been playing. And I'm happy to announce this week I've actually been playing something that I can talk about. Uh, last week, I, <laughs> I came up short in this section. Um, 
I finally got to play Ghost Runner. I did get a code for my channel, and um, I am happy to say this game is awesome. Yeah? I, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely recommend Ghost Runner. Um, if you are looking for a cyberpunk-themed, like this game looks very much like the aesthetic you would expect from Cyberpunk 2077. So if you're kind of like looking for something to whet your appetite along those lines, but more of a um, an action game than an RPG, I'd absolutely recommend it. It is very challenging, though. Um, so basically in this game, you're running through these levels in a first-person uh, perspective, and you have a you start out with a sword, like a katana, that you can slice people up with. But it's basically, it's kind of like a roguelite in a, in a way that, well, did you play Katana Zero? I did by not. By chance. No, so in that game, you have to go through these levels, and it's one hit, one kill. So if you if you get hit, you you have to start the level over, and if you k- hit an enemy, they're dead in one shot. It's the same thing in Ghost Runner. So you're running through, and it'll give you a series of like four enemies that you have to like wall jump and then target and then jump in and kill and slash. And if you don't do it perfectly with those four enemies, if they hit you, you'll have to start that section of the level over. And it doesn't do it for the whole level, just these short little sections but it is really addicting and rewarding to try over and over again until you finally get it. Uh, so that's awesome. It's just a cool, cool gameplay loop. And then it also has a really awesome progression system where you earn new abilities and new uh, new upgrades. And <laughs> each upgrade is shaped like a Tetris block, and you only have so much space on the screen to fit these Tetris blocks into your upgrade compartment. So you literally have to play like Tetris in order to get the most out of your upgrades, which is really, really creative and fun. So that's highly cool. recommend it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a very creative game. Um, uh, yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but yeah, very cool. If you if you're looking for again something that's kind of along the lines of cyberpunk, uh, before that game comes out, not an RPG though. It's definitely a purebred action game, no doubt. Yes, it it looks awesome. It's great to hear that you you're really enjoying it. Um, yeah, and I know a lot of people are probably looking for the cyberpunk like experience since you know everything's going on with that, but um. In terms of what I've been playing, just Watch Dogs Legion for me. I mean, I've always played Warzone casually, but Watch Dogs Legion, uh, this is going to sound like a knock, but I genuinely don't mean it in a bad way. It's it's junk food. It's it's just <laughs> really fun, casual. It's a great time. You can just sink into your couch or chair, however you game, and just throw this thing on and get engrossed and just have a really good time for several hours at a time. And that's what I've been doing with... Watch Dogs Legion, slowly making my way through the story. Um, I actually am not positive that I'm going to beat it before Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So, um, and before all of the, you know, other consoles come out. So that's going to be a bit of a bummer, but I am happy that I will be able to pick it up on the Xbox Series X. So that's what I'm kind of looking forward to and kind of playing it with higher fidelity, ray tracing, all of that. I think that'll kind of push me over the finish line with Watch Dogs Legion, but it's just such an enjoyable game, uh, Josh. Yeah. I love it, and it's I, I haven't been able to finish it because I've, I've been doing other stuff as well, but it's on my list of games I absolutely want to finish before getting into the game of the year discussion because I think it's already one of my most underrated games of the of the year. And uh, yeah, with next gen coming around the corner, did you see the, the the trailer they released for the ray tracing on Xbox One or Xbox yeah. Series X? Yes, it looks yeah. so good. Yep. So Very excited I'm, for that. I'm right there with you. I'm going to uh, hopefully finish this game up uh, down the road, but um, it's it's going to be tough to squeeze in, unfortunately. But uh, great game. I'm right there with you. Love it. We are now going to dig into our mailbag. As we said at the top of the show, you can write into preloadedpodcast at gmail.com if you want to give us any feedback or ask us your questions. And if you do ask us a question, uh, there's a good chance we may read it here on the show and discuss. And this week, James wrote in and asked us, thank you very much for the question, James. He asks, what are favorite, and I am paraphrasing here, but uh, what are our favorite game franchises? Uh, He mentioned that he's gotten into Assassin's Creed with Jackson. I know you're heavily into Assassin's Creed and that is his favorite game franchise, but what are your favorite game franchises or franchise and what got you into it? So I'm going to name a couple, and I'm not going to spend a too much time too much time on each individual one. Um, so Assassin's Creed, I'm right there with you, James. Also, shout out to James. He's been pl- replaying the entire series of Assassin's Creed before Valhalla. Awesome. Dude's played like 10 games in the last two months. He's been telling me about <laughs> it. I don't know how you do it, James. You're a machine. Anyways, 
Um, Assassin's Creed got into it from the very beginning. I just dug the aesthetic and the conspiracy behind it, and it felt really new and fresh, and I've been playing the games ever since, you know, skipping a few here and there. But uh, love Assassin's Creed. My next favorite is Mass Effect, which uh, we've had some rumors about a, a remake. The first one is still my favorite. I still have faith that Bioware can right the ship on that franchise. So um, I love Mass Effect as an RPG and just as a sci-fi game. I think it's fantastic. Um, what else? I, I'm actually going to say Grand Theft Auto. Um, San Andreas was one of my favorite games still in my head. It's one of the most nostalgic experiences for me. I played that game so much as a kid. Loved it. Um, Red Dead is on this list, too. Um, I actually played the original Red Dead Revolver before Red Dead Redemption, mm. and I loved Revolver. Very different kind of game, more linear. Um, but then Redemption came out, was amazing. Redemption 2 came out. Obviously, you guys know how that turned out. Uh, Bioshock is on my list, too. Incredible franchise. Can't wait to see where that goes next. Uh, I could probably go on, but I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, I know that. I mean, those are all great franchises, and... Uh, a couple of them are on my list. Definitely Assassin's Creed is becoming one for me. It hasn't always been, but with Odyssey and uh, Valhalla looking to be just more of Odyssey, I, I think that'll be one for me. But I would have to say in terms of overall franchises, what's at the top of my list uh, right now at this kind of point in my gaming career would be the Arkham series. Um, that last generation was, you know, we talked about last generation, and I guess this goes to the even prior generation. When I played uh, Arkham... Uh, Asylum, it instantly became one of my favorite games of all time. And I think it would probably make my top five list if I were to put that list together, if not top 10. And then uh, Arkham City was just unbelievable. I loved what they did with the story, how they took risks. And this is a spoiler alert if you haven't played Arkham, but uh, they like they freaking killed the Joker. Like, how do you do that, you know, in a game? And they 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 pulled it off incredibly well. And then I loved Arkham Knight more than most people with the uh, the Batmobile. I actually really liked and I played Arkham VR, so that's that's one of my, if not my favorite, uh, kind of. I guess you might be able to call it a current franchise. We may, I don't know, maybe we won't get another Arkham game. That would make me sad. But <laughs> anyhow, um, moving on from that, the other one I want to mention is a uh, Tomb Raider. Actually, so going way back to my early days, the original Tomb Raider and Tomb Raider Two for the PlayStation One were at the time just. Uh, completely unbelievable games to me. I love playing them. That was one of my favorite franchises of that generation. But I feel that what Crystal Dynamics did with rebooting that franchise, the uh, the reboot of Tomb Raider was good, but Rise of the Tomb Raider is, again, probably one of my top five, if not top 10 games of the last 10 years. An unbelievable game if you haven't played Rise of the Tomb Raider. Uh, and then Shadow of the Tomb Raider was was good. I wouldn't put it up at the level of the first two. But again, another another great game, just if you like third-person action adventures where you get to explore and discover secrets and they, the games had pretty good combat as well. Those would be, um, those would put Tomb Raider on the list for me. So thank you, James, for the, uh, or yeah, that was from James. Thank you, James, for the question. Again, you can write into preloadedpodcast at gmail.com if you want to ask us a question and have us discuss it on the following week's show. And with that, we are going to wrap it up. Uh, you can subscribe or rate our podcast if you're listening, again, on the audio platform. So we'd really appreciate it if you did. And write us a review if you're feeling generous. And before we go, Jackson, did you want to plug anything on your channel? Uh, yes, I'm uploading something the day that you guys are watching this uh, and listening to this podcast. Check out my channel. I have something really special planned that you don't want to miss. I can't say anything more. And also follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm JV on YT. Awesome. And uh, likewise, I will be uploading a video, I believe, on Friday as well. And then the following Monday, uh, I can't talk about what it is either, but I do think uh, y'all will be interested in it. So tune in for that. And you can also find me on social media. I am at Quest Mode Games on Twitter and Instagram. And with that, we are all done with this week's episode. Thank you for tuning in on YouTube and wherever you listen. We will see you next week. Bye, guys.